change. And one of the reasons we identified that there's some things we may put in here knowing good and well that unless something miraculous happens, we're not going to have the money for. Um, but it's not, a, you know, you're not eligible for grants if it's not listed in your plan. So we identified, and our funding source may be trying to, you know, go out, you know, if you identify this, let's go out and see if we can find a way to, you know, a grant somewhere or something to pay for it. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of give you a, a rough overview, um, you know, <clears throat> as we've gone through this process, most of our hazards have stayed the same. You know, there's not really uh, a whole lot new changing. Um, and, and the ones we've identified that we've had forever are dam failure, droughts, extreme cold or heat, floods, hail, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, uh, thunderstorm wind damage, lightning, and sinkholes. The one thing that we did add this time that we're adding to this, this update, um, it's not really a new hazard, it's just one that I guess we kind of have a Thought about it for whatever reason we haven't included in the past, but we've added a, a hazard uh, and we call it public health emergency. So things like Ebola, pandemic flu, this new um, Zika virus that, that's come out recently. Some of those things we, you know, we think about the, all the natural hazards and weather related stuff, um, but we're just as susceptible um, to some of those health health related emergencies. Um, so we want to make sure we capture some of those and identify some things and that we work with our partners at Public Health, Dr. Grill and his staff to um, mitigate some of those and, and again, hopefully help improve the community and make things um, you know, a little bit better um, for the citizens. Um, <clears throat> so before I kind of go on, um, do you have any questions about any of that? How, how, um, Important, effective, benefit. Is there a lot of study that was done? Um, when, because I noticed last time in reading through this that, that a lot of the high priority um, action items that are on your list are related to flooding. It seems like, as you said, is that fair to say that most of your high priority stuff is related to flooding? They are. Is that is that the higher study that was done? It, it, Did that help determine that a retention pond is not necessary or is not cost effective? Or? Well, that, that was actually kind of two separate projects. The uh, I think the, the retention pond study um, was done actually prior to the LIDAR being started. Um, so, but the LIDAR was, it, it's kind of, and that's what a lot of these are, it's kind of steps. So, the LIDAR, um, it, it benefits us in ways other than flooding, but it gives us some better um, elevation data. So now we can take the LIDAR data that we have and give that to the, to the experts, the weather service, the USGS, those kind of people. And they can get, do a little bit better flood study. Um, you know, and, and really that, that's going to help us in the unincorporated areas when we, because the city, um, in, in, inside the city limits, they already had um, elevation data down to I think the one or two foot contours <clears throat> but once you got outside the city limits we had 10 foot contours right. so now for the entire length of the river now that's an expensive undertaking to do a whole they kind of do in sections um, but now they'll be able to take that that better elevation data and be able to better determine um, you know do a better study and figure out where areas flood at what stages um, one of the immediate benefits that I see is um, earlier this year, or, or last year, you know, near the end of last year, um, we worked with the Weather Service and we wanted to um, make everything consistent throughout the entire river basin, so all the way to Tifton, Cook County, us, all the way down to Florida. Um, what we used to do, we used to use what they call a gauge zero. So like if, it, if I said the river was getting 15 feet, that meant the water was 15 feet deep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now everything's been changed, and so it's actually relative to sea level. So like today, um, you know, we're talking about the, the with the Gucci River reaching flood stage of 135 feet. That doesn't mean there's 135 feet deep of water at sea level. But now as a homeowner, if you've got a, say you've got a cabin along the river, and you know that your, your cabin sits at elevation of 137, and I tell you the river's going to rise to 138, then you know, now you've got that better data and you can kind of look and say, okay, 
you know, I'm probably I might, there's a good chance I'm not going to put a water in my house. I might need to start moving some of the furniture out. So that gives us a little, little bit. We can provide better information and maybe a little, little better warning. So, um, so that's the immediate benefit. Like I said, hopefully we're going to be able to take that and do some, some updating the flood maps and, and better. Um, our ultimate goal, we would look, we, we ultimately would like to work with all the, the partners to have a interactive um, flood map, and that's one of our identified um, items that we're going to keep. Um, they have one for a small section of the river in Albany, um, and, and basically what that is, is if you went to the, to the website where you look at the stream gauge and you kind of mouse over, if they forecast the river's going to get to a certain point, you just kind of move the mouse up to that elevation and it'll kind of fill in the shade in and show you what areas would probably be flooded, would be impacted. Um, so it gives you a, a, a visual <laughs> Overlay on the map of what areas would be flooded, and so that's that's one of the things that the lidar is going to help us do as well. Where we um, actually with the lidar and the information that's provided, would it also be a tool or that that would I guess determine and reset that 100 year flood, <coughs> or is that done totally and completely separately? It's if 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 FEMA one and two, and that's kind of the, um, they set the original, they set the 100 year flood plan, and then they came and did, um, it was right before my time, I believe, I think around 07, 06, 07, they came and did an update, but all they did was they digitized it. They mm -hmm. kind of updated, um, they didn't really change any boundaries. Um, so once they get everything, you know, nationwide under the digitized, they call it deep firm, then they'll come back and we stand a better chance now that we have that lighter data. You know, that's something we have better data to give them. Um, you know, they're going to look, and, and we don't have a time frame. You know, they may have a coming in city or coming in any uh, in specific time. But they can now come back in and do a more detailed study, have better information to, to draw those lines. And, um, and they may update, update those, um, those boundaries. Um, but that's why it's important to us. You know, and the message we keep preaching is it doesn't matter if you live in the, the hundred year flood plain or not. You know, the, that's just a, a boundary on paper. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to encourage everybody just because you know if, if, if you live right across the street from the hundred year flood plain, you know, you, you, you could still get flooded. Sure. Um, you know, and, and, and they're trying to get away from using the term 100, 500 and and call it. Um, you know, it's basically. I think the 100 year flood plain is a 1%, so that means there's a 1% chance in any given year. Um, yeah, because a lot of people, when they hear 100 year flood plain, they say, okay, we had 100 year flood, we're good for another 99. And I think, you know, you can have 100 year flood three years in a row. Yeah. So, um, so we're trying to, you know, and, that, and that's again one of the things we've been about. We, we need to do a better job of educating people what these terms mean and kind of make it more user friendly. So when we put something out, they understand. Um, fortunately, we have enough historical data, so like when we use code red, um, rather than referencing the river, you know, basically, we try and reference a previous event and say, if you had flooding problems during this event that we recently had, you can expect that you're going to, you know, this is kind of what you're going to relate it to, so you can kind of visualize, okay, you know, if I flooded last time, and they're saying this is going to be worse, you know, chances are I'm going to flood again. So just work on our messages and getting, getting that out. So is there is there truth to the fact or I heard that with this LIDAR they're showing the watershed and the flooding issues that are coming from north of Tipton, whatever. Um, they don't those some of the smaller cities don't have the same requirements that, that we as a county or for instance the city of Alasta has in controlling their water runoff. And ultimately, everything upstream is causing a lot of the problems that we're having here. <clears throat> I'm going to say, as far as runoff, I, I really don't know. That, that would be probably an engineering question. And probably something to ask them. I, I'm not sure about the regulations. I will say that it is true that a lot of what, <clears throat> kind of what we get, we were talking about this um, earlier, is like today, the rain that we got, the five inches, like we got five inches of rain in hour um, so far. That immediately is causing a little bit of a rise. But you know, now once it stops raining, 
now all that rain fell upstream, it has to work its way down. Right. So you go, that's why you see that continual rise. So that's, that's kind of where we get in trouble is when we get a bunch of rain and they get it north of us. Um, you know, and there's really nothing you can you can do about that. Right? You know, I mean, you, you want the water to run off, and, and the rivers have a pretty good, I mean, you know, we have a pretty, pretty good capacity. Um, you know, the, the, two, the two times that we recently that we've had a big flooding issue, the problem has been we had a, a heavy rain event one weekend that kind of got the rivers up, and then before they go back down, the next weekend we have another one. So, that, you know, it really doesn't, you know, I, I guess you could look at some engineering stuff, um, but, you know, I, we kind of, I, I kind of look at it, I mean, that's, that's an act of God. I mean, that's nature. You can't really control the rain where it falls. You just, you know, so we try to focus on, you know, rather we can't prevent it. You know, we're, you know, I know we're still working and looking at things like that. And, um, you know, and I know the city of Austin has, you know, had lots of meetings with their city counterparts to the north of us and trying to get them to do some stuff. But ultimately, we can't control what they do. So we want to make sure, and that's part of our mitigation plan. We'll make sure we've got as many steps in place to to protect us. And you know, that's kind of what I what I say. You know, people say, well, what if you built like Meadowbrook instead of a retention pond? What if you built a, a wall? Well, that's going to keep those areas from flooding, but everything you do in one spot, you're having an impact somewhere else. Right. So you're just pushing that water somewhere else. Um, you know, so you know, we can do things here um, to to maybe you know make our flooding less. Then the people down in Florida are going to be screaming at us like we're screaming at, at right. Tifton. So it's kind of a... Isn't hmm. that kind of what's going on now? you got Highway 94, which is what, 133? Mm -hmm. 84, Nancy Road, National Highway. And that's flood plain. <clears throat> they put a bridge in the center and then they put dirt. So they have to be So they're bottling that kind of thing. And you got railroad trusses. Seems like to me that that water coming down can't fan out naturally like it used to, and it's just stacking up. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Anybody ever? I mean, there's been there's been talk about that. I mean, that's that's engineering stuff. Yeah. Oh. Um, but but I do know that when they like eight at eighty four, um, you know, even though we've closed eighty four before, um, the the way they design that is there's usually. Like if you go, um, say you go to 122, you go out toward Little you know, there's actually a couple of sets of bridges, and only one of them is over the river. The reason, you know, the other ones are overflow. So it's kind of designed so you can have, kind of have it fan right. out and, and flood, certainly you know, flood that area without flooding the roadway. Yeah. And, but, you know, just common sense tells me naturally <clears throat> when you've got a mile plus of flood plain. You build this nice road and you put a 100, 150 section of bridge in there and everything else is dirt. It's piling back up. Well, and, and kind of, the, the kind of goes back to we can't take the road back out. You know, what they did, you know, that may have impacted us. So, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to look at things we, we can do now that are kind of in our control. Is that the middle of the That is, yes. So really what LIDAR actually does is it's going to give you a tool to be able to more precisely warn citizens in Lowndes County of pending flood issues. Because rather than by, I believe you said by template gauges, it's by... Uh, we're down to one one foot, I think, in yeah. foot contours, and maybe in some places half foot. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, it's going to give us better warning information, but it's also uh, eventually, at some point, we'll be able to use that to create some some models and some, some things. That mm -hmm. we'll Interesting, back to kind of your comment, <clears throat> basically we'll, we'll, what I've seen, we can handle any water that we have. Of course, the water we have is going to affect somebody else. Mm -hmm. Tiffany can handle the water that they have, but they're going to affect us. It's all just moves down. Cumulative effects of all yeah, if we if we get a big rainstorm that just sits on Val Austin and gives us five inches of water, it's not going to hurt us too much. So the problem is we get five inches here and then get continue to get five to, to ten up there, that's really when it that's when it works.
for some reason, it always just seems like kind of the weather patterns are that way. I mean, it just seems to put more water north of us, even though we get rain, we get a little bit more to the north of us. Yeah. That's the, yeah. The, uh, you know, I've, I've obviously learned a lot about weather and stuff since I took this position, and that's um, the one thing that the hydrologists and the weather guys preach is um, it makes a huge difference. You know, just just a few miles, you know, where that rain actually falls and where the heavy rain sets up, you know, has a tremendous impact on whether whether you get flooded or not. And we're talking about, you know, we also have two rivers. We got a little river. Uh, and the river Coochie that come together. Um, so a lot of times, our, you know, our concern is if if the rain falls running to the west and the Little River rises, but the river Coochie, you know, it, it kind of stays to the to the west of 75, then we're okay. But when it kind of sets up over the whole area, and so you've got the Little River and the river Coochie rising at the same time, and they meet, then you dump all that, and that's when the south end of the town, the south end of the town, we start getting the problems with the wastewater. Or, but the only people that had it was the ones that their mortgage company made them get. 
Um, and a lot of people thought, hey, if I don't live in the floodplain, I can't get it, which is also not true. So, you know, we had to do a lot of education to make people um, aware that you can get it. It's actually, if you don't live in the in the floodplain, um, you know, you, you might, like on Park Lane, one side of the road is in the floodplain, one side's not. So one, one person may be paid a higher premium because they're obviously at a higher risk. But you know, if you live across the street, you need the exact same coverage um, for maybe you know half the cost just because you're not inside a designated floodplain, but you're still at risk. You know, some of those people still flood. So I guess I asked because I, I didn't know if we had any possible influence on encouraging um, home insurers to offer particular coverage to individuals. Mm -hmm. um, most, I mean, most of them, uh, you know, most of the homeowners. Um, uh, any, any agent that writes your homeowner's insurance can write a flood policy. And uh, so obviously, um, kind of the biggest hindrance there is they don't really make money on it. Uh, you know, they're just kind of underwriting it for the government, so there's not a huge financial incentive for them. That's nothing that we can really control. Um, but you know, your bigger ones, your state farms, your all states, those, um, you know, they, they, it's really up to the homeowner to make sure, but they also, um, the, the good agents and the ones that have been around a while, they kind of know those areas and they'll, they'll recommend, you know, hey, you, know, you, you live close to the, you know, your address is close to the border. And I, I've had some of them, you call me and ask me to verify for them whether a particular property was in the floodplain or not so they can make those recommendations. Um, you know, but really, you know, ultimately it comes back to, you know, we provide information trying to you know, let people know what's available. That comes down to um, uh, you know some personal responsibility when taking the, the kind of onus to make a seat. You know, do I do I live in an area that um, that you know, I need to really be looking at this? And and, and obviously, you know, unfortunately, some of it is you know especially like Melbourne Park, like you, you've got a lot of older people live there, um, so they're doing good just to pay their regular homeowners insurance. So adding, you know, even if it's only two or three hundred dollars a year, you know, some of them just said financially we just can't afford it. I, I guess that the, you know, um, the one issue that I, I noticed in your report that you know, part of the just talked about that, that, that is big that I didn't even know about is the sinkholes that we have. Uh, and, and and then you, I didn't know we had that many sinkholes until we found out about the one sinkhole. And it is, it's like I was well. Everybody was just talking about how Lyles County is sitting on a honeycomb or something like that effect. I was like, wow. So I was just wondering, is it possible even for people to get some type of insurance for the for sea coals? Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know. Relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, I actually, and, and, and I, the way I found out about that is I, um, we had a, a, a citizen, one, their house was actually, you know, there was a sinkhole form kind of right on the edge of their house. And of course, it was on private property. wasn't much we could do, but I called a friend of mine at the insurance company, um, kind of find out. And um, he said, Yeah, he said, we can write single code. He said, As a matter of fact, he said, I had to think about it. He said, I'm going to go look at having a writer on my, my, my house, my policy. So um, I did the money. I mean, because I, I really didn't know we had that many sinkholes. Mm -hmm. And right after we got dip done with one, it seemed like another one was about to start. <laughs> so. yeah. and, that, and that's the thing about those is you don't really know, um, you know where they are or where they're going to pull them. You know, and again, that's one of the things we identified it in here. Um, but again, you know, if, if, we had, if we had a blank check, then, you know, we could go do a ground penetrate radar and find out where they all are in the county. Um, but we don't have that. That's what, why we, um, you know, in our um, mitigation steps, just making people aware that hey, you know, we do live in a um, in an environment that's kind of susceptible to sinkholes. So you know, if you're building a you know a, a apartment complex or you're doing some big development, it might be to your benefit to you know spend a little extra money on the front of your research and make sure you're not building a pop up sinkhole, especially in areas that we know of, like Snake Nation area, those areas we've had problems before. Um, you know, definitely make people aware of that. A feel when we got it done. I'm right on the line. <laughs> Actually, the items listed, the risk listed in Chapter 2, are they in order of priority or risk? Or? No, no, they're not. They're not really um, prioritized. The 
because it, 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 it changes. Um, you know, you know in, in 2009, um, flooding, you know, flooding was our, our big, big risk. That's what everybody wanted to focus on. Um, but, you know, December last year, if you had asked somebody, tornado was up again. That's yeah. one of the one hit lane deaths. So it's kind of what the, the latest thing is. Um, but, you know, and that's, that's the challenge um, in our position is trying to keep everybody focused on everything, you know, because you're over here worried about a tornado and then a flood sneaks up on you. Um, so that we really, our, our planning, whether it's the mitigation plan or our emergency operations plan, we're going to talk about it in a minute. We try to take an all hazard approach because a lot of it, it really doesn't, you know, from, from an emergency management standpoint, you kind of respond the same way. The coordination is the same. You might have different players playing play roles, but um, a lot of it's the same when you're talking about a tornado or a flood. Um, but, you know, when we're looking at mitigation, um, you know, we try and find those specific, you know, we try and capture everything. And uh, so, and that's kind of the difference in the mitigation plan and operations plan. You know, operations, we're talking about actually going out and responding when something's happening. In mitigation, we're trying to do some things before it happens so that when we do have to respond, maybe it won't be so bad. Now, actually, it's, it's, it's the tornadoes um, and that thing you call the burst considered high winds. I, I still got people ask about, you know, the difference between the two. Because you know that what went down, and I think Clive, you said it was a burst it versus was a, a tornado. tornado. Mm -hmm. and people were saying they sound like a tornado, mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't, you know. The, the only difference is whether it's rotating or not. <clears throat> With a downburst, you get 75 mile hour winds going in a straight line, and it blows everything down this way. Um, with a tornado, you've got 75 mile hour winds, but it's just circling, so it kind of, instead of going straight, it just kind of lays everything out, you know, almost kind of like, you know, the, the Red Sea part or something, you, know, you, you can kind of see. Um, as far as damage-wise, um, and really, the, the other big thing is the downburst, you really get no warning. Um, you don't always get warning with a tornado, but at least with a, with a, um, with a tornado, a lot of times the weather service, when they're looking at that rail, they can kind of see that. That circulation up in the upper atmosphere, you realize, hey, something's fixing to drop down. You know, it could drop down and form a tornado. So maybe we get five or ten minutes warning. For those downbursts, it just all of a sudden it comes down, it does its damage, and it's gone. Um, so, and, that, and that's that's one of the hardest things when something happens. You know, it's not that we're trying to tell people, you know, I mean, we understand you have damage. The damage is the same whether it was in a straight line or circling. But from a meteorological standpoint, from a warning standpoint, we want to know if it was a tornado and we didn't catch it, we didn't give you warning, we want to know why so that next time we can do a better job. It's not what we're trying to say you don't know what you're talking about, but there is a difference. And so when we're looking at it, when they say it's a tornado or it's not, uh, I'd say at the end of the day, the damage is the same. Uh, and, and kind of how we respond to it is the same. I think they, they, they asked about it mainly because of insurance claim purposes. They said it was a difference in how the insurance was going to pay if mm -hmm. it was called a tornado versus the burst or something. Yeah, see, I, I don't, I don't I remember know. that. I, I, I don't like you said. I mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> wind, wind damage is wind damage. So, um, yeah. so um, yeah, I'm, I'll uh, make a note and I'll, I'll ask a couple of my insurance friends if there's a difference in tornado damage and straight line winds. And some of the, the way you claim it on your insurance, the way you have a specific tornado or when you claim it, it works with it. Um, a good point related to that that we struggle a little bit with regards to communications is that people have become very dependent, which is good, on the code system. But whenever we do have a wind bill, you know, that weather warning goes out from the National Weather Service because we have that automated as a part of the contract that you all approve. But the event, because wind events are so quick, could have come and gone before they ever get notification. So it is so important for citizens to have more than one tool in their box as far as their awareness as it relates to that. Um, you know, people have now rely on their cell phones and kind of thrown out their middle weather radios, which is a bad thing to do because that's more of an instantaneous broadcast because it doesn't go through a calling system. So when we do have those things forecast, it's important that people do sign up for Code Red, but they also keep their NOAA on and remain aware of their surroundings and all those things. 
but also, and Ashley might be kicking ahead a little bit, but also on the, from the standpoint of you have a tornado, and depending on the extent of the damage, you don't always get a FEMA declaration just simply to talk and pad a tornado or straight line wind. They have to come down and actually, there, there's, a, there's a formula or something that they use to determine before you get a declaration. That's right. <clears throat> kind of the declaration process is um, when we have an event, if, our, if it's more than we can handle with our local resources, then our next step is to reach out to the state um, and, and request. So you may hear the governor declares a state of emergency. You know, he, he can declare a state of emergency for Lowndes County because we had a tornado. All that means is now any, any state resources, state assets are at our disposal. Um, you know, equipment, personnel, those kind of things. Doesn't bring any money with it. You know, we don't get any money from the state for a disaster. Um, typically, if it's just one or two counties that's affected, you're not going to get a presidential declaration. Um, there, you know, and unfortunately, there there is a there is a formula for local government. So, like if our roads get tore up, our bridges, you know, our buildings, um, then there's a formula. We basically there has to be 13 million dollars worth of damage statewide. So you take all the counties that were affected, add them all up. If their damage comes to 13 million. Um, then the governor may request, you know, through FEMA for a presidential disaster declaration. They'll come down, they'll verify. They're not going to take our word for the damage. They will come down, whatever we can document and verify. Then, if we get a, a, a presidential declaration, um, for us to get included in that, we have to have uh, a per capita number. Fortunately, our number is like half a million dollars. So if we, if we had, let's say we had another big flood event, you know, and there's $15 million in South, a uh, damage in South Georgia, and um, and we have a million dollars of damage, then there's a good likelihood that, that you know, we, we might we get included in a disaster declaration. That's for local governments. Um, the part that there's really no rhyme or reason, and you can't base it, is individual assistance, which is what's available for homeowners. Um, you know, so if you have a flood or a tornado or something come through, uh, we had a tornado come through um, you know, a couple of years ago uh, up in uh, up Walker's Crossing area, kind of come through and went over to Lanier County. Um, 25, there's about 25 homes in Lowndes County that were damaged. And for every one of those people, that was a big disaster. That's the biggest disaster they've ever seen. But when you look at it in the broad scope of the nation to FEMA, those 25 homes are nothing. So we didn't, you know, we didn't get a presidential de declaration. And people, you know, they've they've come to, you know, and there were people that didn't understand why, why is FEMA not here? Why aren't we getting money? Why aren't we getting help? And even, you know, the if you went and talked to the people that were affected by the flooding, even when FEMA does come in, there's a cap on the on the, you know, it's a it's a graduated scale. So for example, um, you know, I know there was a there was an elderly couple who went to my church. Their house got flooded. It cost them a hundred and four thousand dollars, I think, to tear out everything and fix everything back, get everything back to the way it was before, and they got thirty thousand dollars from them. But it insured the homeowners. Um, I don't believe. I don't believe they. The flood, the flood. Did this couple didn't have flood insurance. Is that no, money no. from FEMA? Is that a gift it, or is it a low interest money? No, it, the money from FEMA is a gift. So it's it's a it's a grant basically. They give they give them thirty thousand um, dollars. Now again, that's uninsured. So if they, people have flood insurance, they didn't get anything from them. Um, but then what FEMA doesn't cover, they can apply for a low interest loan to the SBA. Um, and there are some people that actually come out. You know, as bad as the flood was, um, you know, and it, it stinks that you have to pay for all that yourself. There are people that. Are, able to refinance their house, you know, go from a 5% mortgage to a 2% with this, you know, so that was a little bit, softened the blow a little bit, um, but it still didn't, you know, they still wish they hadn't got flooded, but. Um, and sometimes there's no free money grant, like there's no free money period, the SBA will still come in. And that's a little bit hard to educate the citizens on because they hear FEMA's here and we start advertising there's a place for you to come fill out some paperwork. 
So they think they're filling out paperwork for money when they get there, and it's a long process. We, mm -hmm. We've had that. I'm sorry, SBA is a small business small association. Business administration. So the small business association would give you a, a home loan, you say? Yes, sir. For, they have a disaster program. Okay. Um, now, I mean, we could go get one today, but during a disaster, if we meet, and I think it's, I think it is um, 25 uninsured homes, and when we do a damage assessment, they have scales. So there's affected, minor damage, major damage, and destroyed. Um, and so the homes that are considered major or destroyed, basically 50% 50, 50 of the value of the home in damage or more. Um, so if we had 25 of those, we might get an SBA declaration, uh, which means the was not coming, the SBA may come in and offer those people those low interest homes. And that, that, happens, that happens more frequently than, um, than getting a presidential declaration.
number one, I don't want to be anywhere near where the horse is flying. <laughs> and uh, like I say, and, and we like to think about our SWAT guys, and it's cool to think about all the guys. But honestly, it's that patrol guy, you know, I mean, it's over so quick. You know, they're going in there, and it's usually um, most active shooter incidents. Um, I think I read a statistic somewhere, it's like less than five minutes. Because um, either either they finish shooting who they're after, or they're taking, you know, they're taking their self out. Law enforcement gets there and takes them out. Or like the one, um, well, I think San Bernardino, those, those people, they got in, they shot who they wanted to shoot, and they were gone. Um, they didn't they stick around waiting for the cops to get there. So those are rapidly evolved events. Like I said, if we would, and you know, I mean, just because the shooter's down, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, you know, kind of the kind of the way I I've approached it is you know we have we developed a good relationship with all the different agencies and partners and uh, so I may call them and, and just hey is there anything you need don't really you know if everything's going smooth we you know we don't force ourselves I don't just show up and start getting in the way and start start managing things you know if you look at the, the paper I gave you it's called a coordination plan that's really what I, I'm not in command or control of anything. Um, Actually it was contact on the local state <clears throat> to the state for the availability of resources that we can call on. This past year um, we had activities around VSU Brock Ashley was kind of contact for coordinate without being involved in the decision making he is a tool. Issues related to the graduation this past year actually was a tool in helping make sure that all the resources necessary locally uh, were available from the state. Uh, a 
emergency, whatever. Um, so the first step is, you know, we need to notify, get the right people, like I said, get the right people responding, um, and, and then they notify me. So some of the things that I'm looking for is, first of all, what area are we talking about? Um, you, know, you know, brief overview of what happened, um, you know, how many people we think are affected. Um, you know, if, we, if we got any critical cities, so, so like, for example, for a flood, we got any lift stations, is, is our, you know, water system up and going? Um, you know, those kind of things, you know, any of those critical resources, and what kind of res what, what do you think it is you're going to need as this goes on? Because then I can take that information and be, and be already be working toward, um, you know, anticipating what they're going to need. So when they need it, we've kind of already got it lined up. We're not having to scramble at the last minute. Um, you know, because when something like this goes on, the time is of the essence, you don't always be playing catch up. You want to try and anticipate what you're going to need and have it, have it there. And so once we, we get notified and we, we kind of figure out, okay, this is kind of a, uh, a bigger deal than normal, um, then we activate our local emergency operations plan. Um, that's something else that you know, you will, you'll see an update of um, sometime in, in the coming months. Um, but it, it's pretty much remained unchanged. Um, you know, we've got a pretty good plan in place. Um, and so we activated the appropriate level. You know, just because we have something, we don't. Everybody doesn't have to respond every time. You know, we, we look at our plan, and our plan says, you know, identify by certain functions. You know, if we if we've got a a law enforcement event, then we probably don't need a lot of fire guys, um, and vice versa. So it kind of dictates, you know, who's responsible for. You know, kind of it's kind of designed to keep everybody focused in their, in their lane and. You know, you're focused on your mission and they're focused on theirs and, and everybody's coming together and, and coordinating together. Um, and some situations when we would activate that plan um, would be if whatever's going on exceeds the resources we have available. You know, if it's if half if the city, you know, city blocks on fire, you know, the city of Alaska doesn't have any fire trucks to put out the whole city blocks. So they're going to be calling the county, and we're probably going to be calling um, you know, surrounding counties asking for assistance. Um, if we anticipate, you know what, we've got it right now, and this thing's getting bigger. Um, like, for example, with a flood, you know, we know that, okay, right now we're fine, but the forecast is that, that you know, we're fixing to have a bunch of houses flooded. You know, we need to, we need to uh, already be thinking about the resources we're going to need. Um, anytime we request outside help, um, you know, if it's something that's just going to be profoundly, you know, of some profound significance, again, you know, basically anything that's kind of out of the normal, um, that's going to tax our local resources, um, or if the chairman or one of the mayors declares a local state of emergency, um, again, more likely for one of the reasons we just mentioned, um, if we have a local state of emergency issue, then obviously we're going to have to have a local emergency operations plan, which in turn, um, means we're going to activate our EOC. And there's kind of, we have the, the physical building, um, but we can also set up an EOC on the scene, and it's really dependent on the, the geographic area we talked about earlier. So if we've got something like, like Ocean Pond, everything was focused in one little area. Well, it, did, it didn't make much sense to tell everybody, hey, y'all leave Lake Park, let's go up here to, to the fairgrounds and sit in the building and coordinate things from there. It was easier to coordinate from on the scene. But if you have a hurricane or a flood or something where you've got stuff everywhere spread out, then you want to get everybody in one location where everybody's communicating and coordinating together and working together. Um, so when I need something, you know, if, I, if I need you, I walk over there and ask you. If I need Paige, I walk over there and I'm not having to track y'all down. I'm not having to have two phones to my ear, um, those kind of things. Um, so when we, act, when we activate the EOC, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call Mr. Pritchard and say, hey, you know, we've got this going on, we're going to activate the EOC. Um, if one of the cities is affected, I'm going to let that city manager know, hey, we're activating the EOC, um, you know, because you've got a lot, a lot going on in your jurisdiction. Uh, I'm going to call Paige uh, as the PIO for emergency management. Um, I'm going to let them know once in a row, hey, we're activating the EOC. Number one, so if they need to send somebody over there, but also they can broadcast on the radio that everybody out in the field is responding to know, okay, the EOC is activated, so if you need anything, um, you can call the EOC and they, they can help you out. 
Um, and then we'll identify which one of which of our partners, which of those emergency support function representatives need to respond. Again, you know, if it's the middle of the summer and schools are out, then we, we probably don't need anybody from the school systems. Um, but if we got a hurricane coming, you know, in, in the middle of, of the school year, and yeah, we want the superintendents to be, to be there or some, uh, some representative from the school system. So everybody that's involved in that response is, um, is, uh, is present. And then I leave it up to the county manager, the city managers, they let the elected officials know what's going on, they'll know that we've activated and, uh, and kind of let them know, um, you know keep, keep them brief on what's going on. And then once we get to the EOC, you know, we're going to the plan. Um, you know, it's really about, like I said, more the agency coordination, making sure that everybody that's um, part of the response is there and, and has what they need. Um, and we, use, we have a tool that, that the state gave us called Web EOC. Um, it really helps us document but also is a situation where the school, so whereas before, you know, if something, let's just say that, that we closed Highway 4 um, because it was flooded. Well, before, you kind of had to send out a blast email or you had to make, you know, multiple phone calls. Well, if you get everybody in the same room and you use WebDOC, as soon as the DOT closes Highway 4, they can type in WebDOC, Highway 4 closed due to water on the roadway, and it shows up on the screen or on that user's computer. And everybody at the same time now knows the highway the force closed. So you get the same information at the same time. So that only works. You know, because our biggest problem when something happens is numbers. You know, hey, I heard y'all were closing 84. Well, no, uh, you know, we're not closing yet, we're going to. And uh, so making sure that everybody's got the same information, everybody's seeing the same picture at the same time is going to make confusion and help us work work more efficient, efficiently, and like I said, you know, in the, um, the uh, you know, <clears throat> there is a, a, a room at the EOC for elected officials, for the chairman, the mayors, um, and the other elected officials that are there um, <clears throat> as part of a policy group to kind of set y'all to the side, and, and so we can come in and give you regular briefings, you know, if we needed something, if I needed the chairman to sign a state of emergency, you know, you can come in, we can put that in front of him, give him a sign of state of emergency to, to, um, for us to set up in the state so we can so get some help from them. Um, you know, but we, either myself or, or the county manager would come in and make sure that y'all stayed up to date on what was going on, because y'all are going to get calls, y'all are going to get questions. Um, so again, you know, the important thing is we want to make sure everybody has the same information and everybody's pushing out the same information. Um, and, you know, the other big issue we have is everybody kind of doing their own thing with public information. So that's why we also want to make sure that we included the part about how public information is coordinated during the disaster. Because that can really make or break how your response is due. And like I said, Paige is the PIO for emergency management. Um, so anytime we have a big disaster going on, emergency management is going to coordinate the information. Doesn't mean that, that we're making up what's set, but we just gather all the different pieces of information um, from all the different agencies, the you know, people that are involved, put it together in one consolidated release. Um, you know, that helps us again because it makes sure that we're all saying the same thing. We don't have um, one person saying one thing and somebody saying something conflicted. Um, but it also will help the media because now they've got. They got one release instead of you know ten different releases from you know one from every city, from the hospital, from the schools, everybody. We, we put it all together. Um, and, and the biggest the biggest thing um, and probably the biggest challenge we have is making people understand that there's a process and everything needs to be vetted. Again, we want to make sure we're putting out good information. So we don't want somebody you know, you know reporters gonna try and trick you. So we don't want somebody coming up to a fireman or, or to one of y'all and asking them something and y'all tell them something and then five minutes later they come to the EOC and they contradict it. Um, so we want to make sure that nothing gets released without that on scene incident commander or the people in, you know, in, the, in the EOC um, authorizing it first. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that we're taking, like I said, we're not taking the autonomy away from anybody. Everybody still is you know, responsible for their own information. We're just you know, 
just like we coordinate response, we want to make sure we coordinate that information. Um, you know, the, the term we, we uh, all cliche we always use is everybody speaking in one voice. And, um, you know, that's really when you get in a, into, a, into an issue. And, um, you know, a, a great example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hush, is um, the, in 2013, we didn't have any houses flooded, but the people on the Meadowbrook Park Lane and the Mayor Toby and I were getting nervous again. So I was putting out, you know, we were putting out our um, information like we always do. That morning, we had issued a statement saying, you know, this is, you know, we expect um, another two to three feet of rise from where the water is right now. Well, there was an official from another jurisdiction, from another agency, who was going around and, and, and was talking to the people in that area and telling them that the water had crested. Well then, later that evening, I was going out checking on some things and, and talked to a few people, and, and they said, yeah, so-and-so told us it was it. I said, well, no, uh, based on the information I've got, it's gonna, it's gonna rise. You know, you, you can expect where it is now, expect to be two feet deep uh, before it stops. You know, and so, and so, and that's, you know, I wasn't trying to scare them, but that's a big difference. You know, if you're sitting there trying to decide, do I need to move my cow, do I need to, Get my furniture up on blocks, or I need to move it out. Um, you, know, you need that information, um, and so it made it look like we didn't have our act together. You know, um, when we were not communicating the same message to, to the citizens. So. And Mr. Pritchard has been very generous with actually and I both over the years, as far as our time goes. He and I both have worked in our respective positions in larger. Um, emergencies in the state and out of state. So we have experience in helping manage incidents for things that we've not even had to happen in our community yet. Um, so I think that's... And, and that's, that's one of the great things is I, I get to benefit from the, get the benefit of the experience and we don't have to go to the disaster. So, so plus it gives us it's good networking. So when I need something, yeah. you know, I, I know some people I can call. Hey, remember when I couldn't help you? I'm trying to turn the table. Let, let, let me add, if I could, also from a commissioner's perspective, um, I think we all know that we all have in, in, in much much smaller incidents than anything like this. We get that proverbial phone call and we want to know what's going on. Well, it's real easy for us to begin to kind of say, well, this is what we think is going on, going on, going on. Reality is, again, we're not speaking in one voice when we do that. Uh, and, and then if we get, if we're the ones out there putting out misinformation, then at the end of the day, we're the ones that's, that's really created the problem for some folks and homeowners that really need good data, good straight information, to be able to make decisions about what they're going to do. So it's extremely important that we as commissioners also understand what our role is. As much as we want to know, as much as we're trying to uh, ask, answer the questions that our constituents are sending to us, again, it's, it's extremely important that we coordinate with the professionals that does that and with the information that's provided to us so that, again, we as a whole can speak as one more. So. And then uh, be sure that we're saying the same thing. Uh, because it is really easy to call somebody that you think knows and they really don't. The chairman, if I could add to that, um, during an event, social media can be your biggest friend when people are sharing good, concrete information that citizens need to know quickly. It can also be the biggest undermining of your, undermining your communication plan when people begin to speculate or people take messages out of context and then all of a sudden it starts flooding. So then in the joint information center that I would have with all of the other local PIOs, we're trying to work for Ashley and for you all to get the correct information out. And now we're having to monitor the rumor mill and try to correct all that. So we can have a communications disaster within a local emergency if we lose our opportunity. But you do a good job of keeping us informed and keeping us yeah. straight through. So, I mean, her as a resource, communicate with us and say, you know. Well, yeah, but, but again, it's, it's extremely important, as it was being pointed out, is to understand where your qualified resource is. 
the qualified resource is there, right. not on social media or not on somebody else or even some other agency that may not even really have the information that they need. And I, I think that's really the key is what we're trying to stress. Unverified information taken out of context is dangerous. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I can see your job as being um, more similar to law enforcement. Yeah, most people are extremely grateful when you show up and, and do your best work and you're obviously prepared. But also during the year, I mean, I, I see all this stuff and I can't help but ask and then I'll shut up. But there seems to be so many things in here that are that are sort of deferred and of high importance. Do you have a list of those things in that order where, where you're saying, okay, I'm trying to take away at these based on resources? But a lot of them are not necessarily financially driven uh, tasks. Well, how do you, how do you pick and choose what you do on any given day and what's important? <laughs> that's a, that's a tough question. I opened this conversation up for another 30 minutes, right? Jason, um, that before it makes us. And by and by deferred, it doesn't it doesn't mean that we weren't working on it. It just it just meant that okay we we had it in the plan before. We didn't get it accomplished, so we're going to keep it. So we deferred it. Um, so there may be some things that, that we were working on, we just didn't, didn't get them complete, so we deferred it to the next plan, and we deferred it to the next. Um, you know, again, the majority of it, is, it depends on what the, what the um, hot topic is of, of the day. Um, you know, and I can just see it. So you're Honestly, you're working. You're working. Get anything that I don't. You know, you're working. Anything. You know that multitask. I mean, you have to be able to multitask because you know right now we're working on updating the hazard mitigation plan. We have um, our emergency operations plan is about about to be required to be updated. We're working with the public health uh, folks for an Ebola plan or an infectious disease plan. Not just Ebola, but infectious disease. Um, have been working on getting. Our critical incident stress management program for the for the county up and down. I mean, so there's there's always um, you know you kind of today you may work on this one a little bit. Okay, I got I got this one where I, I'm I'm at a stopping point with this one. So now I'll pick this one up until somebody else come you know gets me this information I need. So I mean, you're kind of always multitasking, working on several things at, at any given time. And now you got to look at Zika. Now we got to look Ashley is the third EM director that I have worked with. And I can say as a part of that that he has built relationships throughout our community that we've never had at the level that we've had before, which helps tremendously not only with his job and maintaining all of this, but then whenever something does go down, um, there are some of those communication hurdles and relationship building steps that you might have to do initially that he's already taken care of. We're, we're in good shape. And that's probably, if you wanted to, so, you know, what, what does anybody do? Building relationships. I mean, you, you may hear, you know, you may hear me asking what I, what I did, and I may tell you about all these meetings I've gone to. And a lot of times you go to a meeting, and the meeting itself yeah. was, was, you know, I feel, you feel like you're wasting your time, but you may have contact and build a relationship during that meeting totally that two years from now, you know, I, you know, you need something. Oh yeah, that guy. I'm gonna call him. Sure. I mean, he's so. a relationship. Oh, we're and we're that's why we. I mean, we're all in the same boat. Oh, it's we're not about that. Yeah. As much about the training as the people you meet and the resources. And yeah. because of that, we've been in it before. Whereas before, we might have to call someone to help us. Where now, we have people that will call us and call Ashley and say, Hey, I saw on the news or saw on WebUSC or something that y'all have something going down. What can I do to help? So to have those relationships to, to, no. to that. No. <laughs> Mr. Pritchard can verify every year. What's when you when we sit down in my budget? What's the one thing I say? Well, I'm not going to tell him that. <laughs> he actually always makes it crystal clear. These are things that would be nice, but whatever you give me, I'll make it work. <clears throat> I just don't let my salary go. Are <laughs> right. you find that first line? I'm good. Are you uh, this mosquito program and all spray? Is that 
come up with you? Any other questions? As you said that in this litigation plan that if it's not in here we can't do the money. Is that what you said? From yes. <clears throat> However, I will caveat that <clears throat> to say <clears throat> for, for you to be eligible for a mitigation grant, it, it has to be a project that's identified in your plan. Okay. Um, if something came up that we didn't foresee and we said, hey, there's a mitigation grant available and we want to do this with it, and it's not in the plan, we just do an amendment to approve it. We did that for Hay Hire um, at the time. There wasn't anything specifically, I think, about um, putting the tornado sirens. And Hay Hire wanted to get a mitigation grant to put a tornado siren inside the city limits. We came back, we did an amendment, added it to it, sent it to Gina, said we support this, and they were able to get the grant. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it makes the process a little harder, but it doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't choose awesome. out all the good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.